I'm standing in the foyer of 221B Baker Street. To my left is a short hallway leading to Mrs. Hudson's rooms. And on my right is the staircase up which so many clients have climbed, seeking the help of the illustrious detective. Mrs. Hudson has kindly permitted me to enter the lodgings of Holmes and Watson because they are at the moment away on a case. Oh, yes. Everything is as it should be. <laughs> the Holmes was not uh, known for being a tidy person. Newspapers scattered about, articles clipped out, no doubt for research. Ah, Yes, there's the bust which Holmes used in the adventure of the empty house. The mantelpiece cluttered as ever, with the Persian slipper hanging half-filled with tobacco. Ah, and here are some fresh cigars in the coal scuttle. Oh, yes, yes, Holmes occasionally smoked cigars. The walking sticks, large magnifying glass on the table near Holmes' favorite chair. And in one of the bookcases, two volumes of Who's Who in Great Britain and America. Also Holmes' own indexed research volumes and his tome on the characteristics of tobacco ash. At the far end of the room is Holmes' chemistry corner where he experimented with various mixtures and poisons. And in fact, if, if you look hard at everything, you can notice that there's not much here belonging to Dr. Watson. Although I do see his medical bag on one table with a few journals tossed casually beside it. Ah, wait, I missed something. There's a notebook. Pen and an ink bottle on the table as well. I wonder if it... Yes. Yes, this is the famous notebook, all right. And from what I can tell, Watson had just finished writing about another adventure the two have had. Let's see. Huh? It's called The Adventure of the Paradol Chamber. Excuse me a moment. I'd like to read this. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathman and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine. I invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell about another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. Of course, I can't be as entertaining as Dr. Watson... But I can tell you something that's really worth knowing. Simply this. The best beginning a good meal ever had is a glass of Petri California Sherry. Petri Sherry is the perfect before-dinner wine. While you're waiting for dinner to be put on the table, pour yourself a glass of that clear, amber-colored Petri Sherry. Now, just sit back and sip it slowly. Take your time so you can thoroughly enjoy every single drop of that wonderful Petri flavor. And what a flavor that Sherry has comes right from the sun-ripened heart of wonderful California grapes. Now, you may be a real wine expert and know all about sherry wine, but believe me, until you've tried a Petri sherry, you're really missing something, and no kidding. Serve Petri sherry alone, or serve it with canopies or appetizers. And by all means, serve it proudly. You can, because the letters P-E-T-R-I spell the proudest name in the history of American wines. Petri. <laughs> And now for our weekly visit with the good Dr. Watson. Let's see if he's expecting us. Come in, come in, come in. Ah, good evening, Doctor. Uh, good evening, Mr. Campbell. It's about time you got here. Draw up a chair and make yourself comfortable. Oh, thanks. Well, you have the old black dispatch box out again, I see. I suppose you've been going over your notes on tonight's adventure. <laughs> yeah, that's right, my boy. And this may interest you. Mrs. Watson figured prominently in the story. She did? Yes, in fact, if it hadn't been for some remarkably quick thinking on her part, Holmes and I might have... Uh, well, there I go again, telling you the end of the story before I forget it. Well, uh, how did it begin, Doctor? On a winter evening in 1887. I'd been married some months, and in consequence, I hadn't seen much of my old friend Sherlock Holmes. Oh, well, you're still living at Baker Street, I suppose. Yes, my boy, but we couldn't persuade him to come around and see us. From time to time, I'd heard some vague accounts of his doings, of his summons to Odessa, in the case of the Trepoff murder and of his clearing up the singular tragedy of the Atkinson brothers. But to, uh, to get back to tonight's story, my wife and I had just finished an excellent dinner. 
I remember it set ourselves down for an evening of pleasant domesticity. She was stitching away on a piece of expert petit pois, and I was at my desk balancing figures in the family account book. After a few moments, my wife looked up to me and said, John, dear, don't look so troubled. Oh, was I looking troubled? Well, you've been scowling at that account book for ten minutes now. What's the matter, dear? Don't the figures add up correctly? Oh, yes, yes, they add up correctly. In fact, they tell a very pretty story. After buying my practice and setting up all my outstanding accounts, I find that we have nearly 150 pounds left of the diary that Mr. Sholto settled upon you. 160, isn't it, dear? I was doing the same sum this morning. Oh, well, 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 but that is 160. In any case, Mary, dear, the point I was going to make is that we, we don't need the money just now. My practice is picking up splendidly, and I was thinking that we might, uh, might invest it in something really sound, of course. Who's been talking to you, John? Dr. Wilson again. Well, uh, as it happens, I did bump into him at the hospital today. He can put us onto something very good in Peruvian silver. Uh, what do you think of the idea? Well, John, the, the fact is, I'd almost decided to make a business investment with it myself. I thought I'd surprise you. Well, now, Mary, now let me tell uh, you about good. it, John. Oh. Yesterday, when you were out on your rounds, yes. a most charming man called here, oh, a Mr. Ted Barber. He introduced himself as a friend of Mrs. Cecil Forrester's. Mm -hmm. He said he was certain we'd be interested in his new company. And he talked so convincingly that, well, I, I'm afraid I almost promised him I'd buy some stock in the company. Oh, did you really? What, what, uh, what sort of company is it? Well, I didn't quite understand that part of it. But it sounded wonderful. He left a prospectus. It's in the right-hand drawer of the desk. It's uh, something to do with a wonderful new metal that's been discovered by an American chemist called Paradel or Paradis or something. Oh, let's have a look at what it says. A company formed to exploit the amazing new metal discovered by Dr. Paradis. Paradol preferred stock. The potentialities of this new alloy are measurable. The fourth dimension has been conquered. What? Spatial dislocation is an accomplished fact. Oh, gracious me, my dear child, this prospectus is absolute poppycock. Now, John, you mustn't be stubborn. Well, I think at least we should investigate. Well, 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 well. The man said that if we went to the laboratories, Dr. Paradis would give us a demonstration himself. But, but Mary, dear, Mary, dear, the fourth dimension, I mean to say, it's obviously fraud. That's what everyone says when a new invention comes out. Now, this might be an opportunity for us to make a lot of money, John. Mary, I do wish you... To that... please me, dear? Well, I can't argue with you very long, Mary. All right, all right. I'll take you to the laboratory in the morning, but I warn you, I'll show this Dr. Paradis up for the charlatan that he is. Uh, Dr. Paradis will be with you both in a moment. Well, thank you, my man. She's just concluding an experiment. She? Dr. Paradis is a woman, then? Oh, yes, madam, and a very brilliant one, too. Excuse me. Oh, it's the last straw. The whole thing sounded like an obvious fraud, and now we get here and find that a woman doctor's at the back of it all. Just because she's a woman, it doesn't mean to say that... How do you do? I'm Dr. Paradis. Oh, how do you do, madam? I'm Dr. Watson, and this is my wife, Mrs. Watson. Oh, yes. Come into the laboratory, won't you? Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Paradis. Well, we're just wasting your time. We're not really interested in this at all, you know. John, feel... don't mutter. Well, Mr. Barber told me that he had called on you, Mrs. Watson, and that you were very interested in my invention. Oh, yes, I am. That's why I persuaded my husband to come down with me and see a demonstration. I'll be most happy to show you everything I can. Here's a practical example of the application of my work. This chamber you see in front of you is made completely of my new alloy. Oh, what's the thing do? It's just a great metal box with a lot of dials and switches and things. Why is it so big? Do, <laughs> do people get inside it? They can. What? Though if they do, they're liable to find themselves transported many miles from here. <laughs> Come inside, won't you? <laughs> oh, what a lot of nonsense. Now, John. Oh, John Before I give you a demonstration, but... I want you both to see that there is no exit from inside this chamber. No trap doors or anything. The only exit is the door we just came through. Yes, it's just like an airtight metal room. Stuffy in here, isn't it? Now, let's go outside again. I'll show you how the machine operates. Albert! Uh, yes, Dr. Paradis. I'm going to demonstrate the Paradol chamber to Dr. and Mrs. Watson. Oh, very well. Uh, the usual time? Yes, please, Albert. Now, my assistant goes inside the chamber. 
I close this metal door on him, so. What are you going to do with him? Within a matter of seconds, he will be seven miles from here. <laughs> Is there really a matter of you? Please, you can't Dr. Expect Watson, us to believe you're a scientific man. <laughs> At least give me the opportunity of demonstrating my work. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Now, I adjust these dials, turn on the electrical generator, and... Good Lord, what an amazing business. Now open the door, Dr. Watson, and look inside, please. Great Scott, he's gone. I don't believe it. Dr. Paradise, will you explain this to me? Gladly. My metal paradol is an unnatural alloy. What? It causes a dislocation in the warp of space and enables us to enter the fourth dimension. <laughs> you see, time is a dimension. Mm -hmm. Any object in the past, present, or future can be described precisely in three dimensions of space and one of time. Yes, but this machine of yours... Um... The alloy of paradol, combined with the great forces of electricity, has created a new force. Mm -hmm. This element is controlled by these dials, and what? it is possible to move in four dimensions at once. Thus, bodies or other objects can be transported great distances away, all in the twinkling of an eye. I coined a word to describe the process. Teleportation, I call it. Teleportation? Well, I'm completely confused. All my scientific training tells me this is impossible, and yet... Uh, uh, I wonder if you'd give us another demonstration. Certainly. Perhaps you yourself would like to be teleported somewhere. Certainly not. Good gracious, we know. Uh, no, no, no I, I think anyway. John would be very unhappy in the fourth dimension. He wouldn't belong. Yes, you, you, you said that any objects could be moved. How about that brown paper parcel on the table over there? Certainly. It only contains some company circulars. I suggest you write your initials on it so that you can identify it later. Oh, very well. J-H-W. There you are. Where do you want it dispatched to? Send it to my house. I'll give you the address. That won't be necessary. Uh, this, is, this is an amazing business. Isn't it, John? Exciting, too. There we are. Now I adjust the dials once more, and... The parcel is already at your house. Oh, Doctor. it's impossible. Come along, Mary. Let's get a cab and race back there as fast as we can. Well, yes, goodbye, Doctor. Good, goodbye, Doctor. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Now, dear, John, you must admit you're just as excited as I am. Well, I confess that I'm enormously intrigued. Let me just get my, my latch front door here. Here we are. It's Dr. Paradis is a devilishly clever woman. Even so, my intelligence tells me it's impossible for the package to have reached here before us. Ah, here we are. Ah, there you are, Master. Mum, just in time for lunch. Tell me, Annie. You did a package arrive for us? Oh, yes, it did, Mum. I put it on the old table. Great <laughs> Scott. Uh, how was it delivered, Annie? Well, now, that's the funny thing about it, sir. I don't know. I went out to polish the brass on the door knocker a few minutes ago, and there was the parson, lying on the doorstep. No one had rung the bell or anything. I didn't know how it got there. <laughs> Thank you, Annie. You, you can go now. Yes, ma'am. Well, John, what do you say now? There's a miracle has been performed. I don't believe my eyes. Look, there are my initials on the package. Mary? I think that if you don't mind, after lunch, I'll... You'll go around to Baker Street and tell Sherlock Holmes about this. Oh, do you mind, dear? Of course not, dear. Good. It'll be nice to see Holmes again anyway. Dr. Watson, how nice to see you again. Hello, Mrs. Hudson. How are you, my dear? Oh, I'm just fine. Oh, you're looking grand, sir. Marriage agrees with you, oh, if you don't you. mind my saying so. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Is, uh, is Mr. Holmes in? Aye, sir. And I'm very glad you're seeing him. He's no been acting like himself lately. Oh, really? Locking his door. And only unlocking it for me when I give him a, a, a password. And he's hardly touched his food for the last three days. To tell you the truth, Dr. Watson, I'm awful worried about him. Well, I'll go up to him. You'll be glad to see you, I'm sure. Yes? Who is it? It's me, Watson. Watson? Oh, possibly. I'm not taking any chances. Holmes, this is ridiculous. Surely you know my voice after all these years? John H. Watson. Tell me what your middle initial stands for and I'll let you in. It stands for Hamish. Watson, my dear fellow, how are you? I am fine and delighted to see you again, Holmes. Uh, 
Incidentally, why all this rigmarole about locked doors and, and passwords? Well, uh, Professor Moriarty has decided that it's high time to settle his score with me. There have been several attempts on my life lately. Twice I've been attacked in the streets, and only yesterday a shot was fired at me through the uh, window you see broken there. Lord Holmes, you must be careful. I am being very careful. That's why I indulged in what you refer to as all this rigmarole. But, uh, well, enough of my problems. What's on your mind? There's a sparkle in your eye and an air of excitement that tells me that you've uh, some news to impart. Well, I, I must say there is something. Of course there is, my dear fellow. Come on, tell me about it. You ever hear of a new metal called Paradol and its inventor, Dr. Paradis? Oh, yes, yes, indeed I have. I received a prospectus concerning it the other day. Well, uh, what, uh, what do you think of the idea? Oh, obviously it's rubbish designed to fool a gullible public into buying shares. Don't tell me that, uh, you were taking it, Oh, right? no, 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 of course not, Holmes. Naturally, as a scientific man, I knew it was rubbish. My, uh, my wife, however, had become a little involved in the concern. And so today, to prove to her that the whole thing was a, was a fraud, we went down to the laboratory and met this Dr. Paradis. Oh, did you indeed? In the first place, let me tell you, this Dr. Paradis <laughs> is a woman. Oh, a woman? As you can imagine, I didn't have any difficulty in discrediting <clears throat> her theories. In fact, I'm afraid I... I made her seem rather stupid. <laughs> However, we did stay there long enough for her to, to give us a demonstration. And that's the way that it was, Holmes. When we got back to our house, the initial package was there, waiting for us. Oh, childish trick. Obviously, the Paradol Chamber contains an ingeniously hidden trap door, through which the assistant disappeared and later the package. A fast cab then took it to your home before you could get there. Oh, yes, oh, really? Well, uh, yes, yes, of course, that's exactly how I explained the thing to Mary. Was she impressed with the feet? Yes, she was, uh, but you know how women are. I tried to tell her the whole thing was a fraud. She's uh, very obstinate. I was hoping perhaps that you will help me expose the concern. Oh, hardly seem necessary, old fellow. That's an obvious fraud. However, for your sake, I'll be glad to do anything I can. Well, I thought we might go down to the laboratory late tonight when nobody's there. And take a look at that paradol chamber a little more closely. Yes, rather a good idea. After being cooped up here for three days, it'll be a pleasure to get some night air and indulge in a little simple burglarizing. Well, shall I call for you here? No, no, wait a minute, dear fellow. It's much too dangerous. Uh, I'll, um, I'll be in a hansom cab outside your house about 11.30 tonight. How's that? Splendid. Quite like old times, isn't it, Holmes? Yes, it is, old chap, though I think that uh, this time, for Mrs. Watson's sake, I must try and keep you out of trouble. <laughs> Yes, Watson. Time that only concerned old bachelors like myself should be wandering the streets of London. Oh, rubbish, Holmes. You talk as if Mary was a tyrant. Now, don't get angry with oh, me, old chap. I was only being facetious. Is this um, hmm? Dr. Parody's laboratory? Yes. I'd like to be seen. I don't imagine it'll be very hard to break in, though. Strike a match, will you? I took the precaution of bringing this lantern. There you are. Thanks, old fellow. Is the, is the door locked? Yes, but I think the skeleton key will do the trick. Hold this lantern for a second, will you? Here you are. Oh, oh this is child's play so far. Come on. There's the, the paradol chamber over there. Uh -huh. Give me the lantern again, old chap, will you? Thanks. Mm -hmm. Quite an elaborate contraption. The door's been left open. Let's go in and take a look at the inside of it. Now, nah, not both of us, Watson. If this is the only entrance and... Uh, the two of us walked in. It'd be too easy to slam the door shut on us. Yeah, I suppose so. You go in and I'll keep watch out here. All right. Oh, I uh, trust that in a few minutes I won't find myself lying on your doorstep. Holmes, there are times when your sense of humor is a little strained. Holmes! Holmes, you all right? Watson! What is it, Holmes? The body of a dead woman. She's been shot. Yes, I'm much mistaken. Let me come and look. A thousand to one, it's Dr. Paradis. Yes, yes, it is. Watson, get out of here. Don't you see that? Good Lord, someone has slammed the, show, the door shut on us. Yes, my dear fellow. We walked into a trap very neatly. I'm afraid that we're imprisoned in what appears to be an airtight metal chamber, and the only person who can help us to get out of it again is a corpse. <laughs>
Dr. Watson's story will continue in just a few seconds. It's time for me to remind you that good food always tastes better when served together with good wine. Did you know that Petri makes two wonderful mealtime wines? Wines especially made to go with food? Well, they do. Petri California Burgundy and Petri California Sauternes. You want a rich, hearty red wine, a wine that's great with any meat or meat dish, you just try a Petri Burgundy. And if you want a wine that's perfect with chicken or fish, try a delicate golden-colored Petri Sauterne. Petri Burgundy if you want a red wine, Petri Sauterne if you want white. But always a Petri wine if you want a good wine. Now back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. It is in the early hours of a winter's morning in 1887. The famous pair, while investigating the mysteries of a scientific laboratory in the east end of London, have been trapped in an airtight metal cabinet, their only companion being the dead body of a woman scientist. As we rejoin our story, Sherlock Holmes and his old friend Dr. Watson are listening intently as footsteps approach what appears to be their metal coffin. There's someone outside. They're sliding back to the mental tunnel. Good evening, gentlemen. That voice, it's Dr. Paradis' assistant. Let us out of here. Or should I be more precise, Mr. Holmes, and say good morning? <laughs> Hello, Moriarty. Moriarty, you scoundrel. I can just get my hands on him. Dr. Watson, I wish you could get over your dislike for me. For my own part, I'm genuinely sorry that my trap had to catch you, too. I've often felt unhappy that you're not on my side. Such slavish admiration of you given your friend Sherlock Holmes must be highly gratified. Hey, never mind about all that. What do you think you're up to? It's obvious, my dear Watson. The whole scheme was a plan to lure me out of my safe hiding by presenting an intriguing problem and one that victimized the wife of my old friend. You knew it would get back to my ears, didn't you, Moriarty? Yes, exactly. But why did you murder this Paradis woman? That's uh, equally obvious, my dear Watson. She had served her purpose in presenting a most convincing scientific front. As soon as the trap was baited, she was a liability. She might tell tales, and so she was killed. Like so many other of your accomplices, my dear professor. Ah, precisely. Now, my dear fellows, I'm afraid that I must close this panel and say goodbye. Quite sorry to have to kill you, but you're becoming dreadfully in my way. And how do you plan to kill us, my auntie? By doing nothing more than closing this panel. Oh, I could be frightfully dramatic and release deadly gases into the chamber, or poisonous snakes, or something equally colorful. But quite frankly, it seems so much simpler just to shut you in. Your oxygen supply won't last very long, you know. And for your benefit, Dr. Watson, I may tell you that Paradol, whatever its other shortcomings as a metal, is bulletproof. But by you meddling fool! Well, there seems nothing for us to do but look around and ascertain our chances of escape. Holmes, I don't like this. We're in a very nasty situation. My dear Watson, sometimes you're a master of understatement. Uh Uh-huh, just as I thought. What have you found, Holmes? Sliding panel, just behind the dead woman. Uh, it leads us to a passageway. A passageway that has been bricked up only within the last few hours. But long enough, I'm afraid, to make it impossible. No, there's no escape here. Hold the lantern a little higher, will you, Walter? Yeah. That's it. Well, what are we going to do now? I was just estimating the cubic capacity of this chamber. The air supply should last comfortably for at least another eight hours. I recommend a a brief sleep to refresh us and also to conserve our oxygen supply. Sleep? Who could sleep at a time like this? I can and you can, old chap, if you discipline yourself. Mm, Well, I'll try, Holmes, but I know perfectly well I shan't close my eyes. Wake up. Uh, yes, Mary dear. Oh, oh. oh, is it you? Oh, we're still in this infernal trap. I'm afraid so, old chap. Uh, what time? Just after seven in the morning. Uh, how long did you estimate our oxygen supply would last? Probably about another hour. Well, it's just possible that some worker will come to the laboratory early and let us out. I shouldn't count too much on that if I were you. Oh, I suppose not. I say, Holmes, I'm I'm famished. Yes, I thought you would be, my dear chap. So I saved you this half of a bar of chocolate. I ate my own share just before you awakened. Oh, thanks, my dear fellow. Uh, did, did you sleep too, no, Holmes? No, I didn't, Watson. 
I employed my time in conducting a minute examination of this chamber. I was trying to find some possible way of getting out. And you failed, eh? I'm afraid so. Holmes, this looks like the end, doesn't it? Well, if it is my time to die, I'm glad that we're together again. Although I blame myself entirely for, for letting you into oh, the trap. come now, my dear fellow. Don't take it as badly as that. But you admitted you're defeated and that there's no possible way out of this desk. I meant that there's no way out from the inside. So my time worked. Good gracious me, what on earth? The star! The star, there you are. Mary! Mary, you dear little thing. You, you must have been frightened to death. Hello, John. Oh, dear, you must have spent a miserable night. Well, 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 well. Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson have been getting themselves in trouble again, eh? Sir, this is no time for your heavy-handed badinage. There's the body of a murdered woman inside that chamber. She was killed by Professor Moriarty. Professor Moriarty? Too bad you didn't get my message sooner. Your message? Well, bless myself, Holmes. I wish you'd tell me how you got your message to to Scotland Yard. Well, ever since these recent attacks on my life, I've had uh, my delightful band of ragamuffins, the Baker Street Irregulars, watching my house in fixed watches, two at a time. I gave the boys instructions to follow me whenever I went out. And if ever I did not reappear within three hours, they were to report to our friend Lestrade at Scotland Yard. Holmes, you're amazing. You, you, you think of everything. Just a minute, gentlemen, just a minute. I didn't get no message from any of your Baker Street irregulars. Oh, you didn't? No, sir. Though I did find a couple of the boys tied up when we came in here just but now. if you didn't get a message from them, how did you come here so opportunely? <laughs> That's an easy one. <laughs> because Mrs. Watson here came and fetched me. You did, Mary, but how on earth... <laughs> Go on, Mom. Huh? Tell them. Well, it's really very simple. When John came back from seeing you yesterday, Mr. Holmes, he was over-elaborately casual in his references to the Peridol chamber. So, of course, I knew at once the two of you were going to investigate the matter. I also caught him oiling his revolver after dinner. I didn't know that you slipped out last night, John. But as soon as I woke up this morning, I realized what had happened. So I went straight to Scotland Yard for Inspector Lestrade and brought him here with me. Why, Mary, you clever little thing. Isn't she a clever darling, Holmes? <laughs> Mrs. Watson, this has been a, a salutary experience. Uh, will you allow me to congratulate you on your deductive ability? Well, that's very nice of you, Mr. Holmes, but I really don't deserve any compliments, if you don't mind my saying so. It was elementary, my dear Mr. Holmes. Elementary. <laughs> This is Bob Campbell saying good night for the Petri family. This program comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The episode you've just heard, called The Paradox Chamber is part of the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce, and is a 1986 copyrighted production of 221A Baker Street Associates. The Sherlock Holmes stories and the characters of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. John H. Watson were created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and are used with the kind permission of Dame Jean Conan Doyle. Well, it's getting a bit chilly out, and it's time to go. For Sherlock Holmes, Dr. Watson, and myself, Ben Wright, thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs>